An alleged hitman accused of blasting to death three drug dealing pals was the best worker a boss could wish for, a court heard yesterday. Scarlett Edgar, who employed Jack Wombs until his arrest in May last year, trembled with emotion as she praised the mechanic. She told the court when she had been asked to give a character reference for Wombs, there wasn't anything bad I could say about him. David Lederman QC, defending the 36-year-old, asked her, would it be right to say if there was anyone you had total confidence in, it was Jack? Miss Edgar replied, yes. I was on holiday when Jack was arrested and he was looking after the firm. He had in his possession a checkbook I had signed. The checks were all blank. There isn't anyone else I could do that with. The old Bailey jury heard. Wombs had worked for Miss Edgar for several years at G&T Commercials in Suffolk. The firm moves cargo to and from the docks in Ipswich and Wombs was a self-employed mechanic who looked after the company's vehicles. Miss Edgar described Wombs as a calm and logical character who did everything he could to help her business. Wombs of Brockford, Suffolk and Michael Steele, 54 of Great Bentley, denied shooting dead three friends on December the 6th, 1995. The bodies of Tony Tucker, 38 of High Road Fobbing, Pat Tate, 37 of Gordon Road, Basildon and Craig Rolfe, 26 of Calshot Avenue, Chafford 100 were found in their Range Rover down remote Workhouse Lane in Rettendon. Wombs and Steele, who also deny smuggling cannabis with Peter Corey, are alleged to have killed them because Tate had threatened to murder Steele after a drug deal went wrong. Corey has also pleaded not guilty to the smuggling charge. The court heard from Ostend hotel owner Maria van der Vel that Steele had paid for rooms in her Belgium establishment for two men and three young girls in November 1995. The jury has already been told those men were two of the victims, Rolf and Tate, who had met Steele in Ostend to be repaid money they had earlier given him for cannabis. The drugs had proven to be dud and Tate was allegedly furious. Mrs. Van der Vel revealed in a written statement that Tate and Rolf had become rowdy and damaged equipment. They had also set off the fire alarm. The trial continues. Okay, now I know a select few people will hear these articles, will listen to these newspaper articles or statements. And one of the things going through their mind will be, well, clearly Steele and Wombs were drug importers. If they're lying about this, then clearly they're lying about committing triple murder. Whereas personally, I don't really see the link there. Now, the reason I don't see the link is because if they had admitted their guilt regarding the drug importations, they were facing a long, long time in prison, regardless if they were found guilty of the triple murders. So in my opinion, they were in a position where it was, you were all in or all out, basically. It was not guilty to all of the charges put before them or guilty to all of them. Now, I know there's some people out there will hear those articles and they'll simply think that Wombs and Steele are inherently dishonest. They've lied about the drug importations, therefore they must be guilty of the triple murders. But then if you turn that on its head and look at the testimony given by Darren Nichols, the evidence which ultimately convicted Wombs and Steele, you can do exactly the same thing. We know for a fact that what he has said cannot be entirely accurate. There's lies in his statements. There are distruths. Therefore, because he's done that, do we completely discredit his evidence? The fact that he was the getaway driver that evening? Everything needs to be based upon its own merits. And as I say, Wombs and Steele were in a no-win situation. What would be the point in admitting to the importation of the cannabis and the various drug trips that they had made when they'd been after Steele for years? They would have thrown a book at Wombs and Steele had they admitted their involvement. They weren't just looking at two or three years in prison. They were looking at a long time inside. So if they were going to say not guilty, they had to say not guilty on both counts of this case. The conspiracy to import cannabis and the triple murder charge. I guess to summarise exactly what I'm trying to say here is that just because someone is a drug importer or a criminal in general does not make them inherently capable of committing triple murder. Just because they may have been dishonest about importing drugs does not mean that they had a motive 
or a willingness to commit triple murder, or even the capability of committing triple murder. These two events need to be treated completely separately. There's a massive difference between being a drug importer and committing triple murder. The next newspaper article comes from the Evening Echo, dated the 23rd of October 1997, with the headline, Solicitor Faces Trial Quiz. The solicitor for a supergrass at the centre of a triple gangland killing denied police had prompted or led his client into making a confession, but Lee Craddock of Maudsley Wright and Pearson in Basildon admitted he was surprised at the numerous hours police had spent in private conversation with Darren Nichols. Mr Craddock was brought in as Nichols' legal representative in May 1995, after the police informer had been arrested for the murder of drug dealers Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe. By the time Mr Craddock came on board, Nichols had already started telling police it was Michael Steele, 54 of Great Bentley, and Jack Wombs, 36 of Brockford, Suffolk, who had pulled the trigger. Mr Craddock told the Old Bailey jury that at no time when he was present did police try to influence Nichols to answer questions in a certain way, and denied his client of being given a prepared script to read on tape. But Graham Parkins QC, appearing on behalf of Steele, expressed surprise when Mr Craddock admitted he had not known the same police officers who had carried out the interviews with Nichols and also had private meetings with him in his cell before Mr Craddock had represented him. Mr Parkins then revealed that during the weeks Mr Craddock represented Nichols, the same officers who interviewed the Supergrass spent more than 30 hours talking to him off tape in his cell, one interview lasting 7 hours and 43 minutes. Mr Parkins said, It is an undesirable procedure for officers to see him in private when they are interviewing him over a length of time. Mr Craddock answered, I wouldn't disagree. The case continues. The next newspaper article comes from the Evening Echo, dated the 6th of November 1997, with the headline, Supergrass Always on My Doorstep. A triple murder defendant has made sensational claims that the prosecution's star witness was a major drug smuggler who had admitted he was willing to kill. Michael Steele, who along with mechanic Jack Wombs has been charged with ruthlessly executing drug dealers Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe, began his evidence on the first day of the defence case. Looking relaxed in a grey tweed jacket and blue open neck shirt, the 54-year-old walked a short distance from the dock to the witness box flanked by a lone security guard. His barrister, Graham Parkins QC, questioned him about some of the evidence the jury has already heard in this long-running trial. When it came to the topic of Supergrass Darren Nichols, who provides the basis of the prosecution case, still said they had met in Hollersley Bay Prison in Suffolk. He revealed, I found there were two sides to him, a very silly side and a very educated side. He's what I would call a habitual, always turning up on my doorstep. It was during one of those visits to Steele's home in St Mary's Road, Great Bentley, Essex, from which Steele ran his business MJS Commerce, that Nichols allegedly made his astonishing confession. Steele told a spellbound Old Bailey jury it was after Nichols had visited Basildon Hospital in November 1994, where Tate was being treated for a gunshot wound to his arm. He said, Nichols told me, I could do that. I could shoot someone. I've often spoken to myself about it. When you got to know Nichols, he was quite schizophrenic. When he said this, he was standing with his hands in his pockets and his head bowed. He looked like a child that had been scolded. Still, said Nichols had been very upset by his visit to the hospital as Tate and his friends had ridiculed him. Steele also told the jury that Nichols was a drugs importer who brought cannabis into the country via car ferries using drivers known as suicide jockeys. Mr Parkins then asked Steele about his relationship with victim Pat Tate, who dealt drugs in jail and often took up to eight ecstasy tablets a day himself. Steele said, When I first knew him, he had a magnetic personality, and while 70% of people liked him, 30% loved him but he gradually changed into a junkie. Michael Steele admitted he was no stranger to the criminal courts. His defence barrister Graham Parkins QC asked, Is it true you are content for the jury to know about things from your past? He replied, I would like the jury to know everything there is to know about me. Mr Parkins then read out a long list of previous convictions. March 1964, sent to prison for 12 months for stealing property and driving while disqualified. 1966, 
sent to prison for six months for stealing property and assault causing actual bodily harm. June 1966, a 12-month conditional discharge for stealing from a vehicle. 1968, fined £15 for possession of an offensive weapon, a motorcycle chain. February 1969, an 18-month jail term suspended for three years for trying to cheat customs of oil duty. March 1972, sentenced to five years in prison for theft from a motor vehicle. February 1980, suspended sentence of six months for theft. September 1980, sent to jail for 12 months for stealing tyres and wheels and being in breach of a suspended sentence. 1986, one year conditional discharge for criminal damage. June 1990, nine years in prison for importing 300 kilos of cannabis in a light aircraft. Steel, a highly experienced pilot, was also ordered to hand over to customs £120,000, half his former marital home, £15,000 from his mum's home, his 33-foot motor cruiser, his aircraft and his land cruiser. The following article comes again from the Evening Echo, dated the 10th of November 1997, with the headline, Fuel Bill Provides Vital Defence Alibi. A simple petrol receipt could spell freedom for a triple murder defendant, an Old Bailey jury has heard. Michael Steele, 54, accused of gunning down three drug-dealing pals with the help of right-hand man Jack Wombs, strenuously denies the killings. The court has already heard from Supergrass and star prosecution witness Darren Nichols, who claims he was the unwitting getaway driver for the murders. He told the court he met Steele and Wombs in Mark's Tay near Colchester at 5pm on December the 6th, and the trio then drove via a roundabout route to Workhouse Lane in Rettendon. In court on Friday, Steele's barrister, Graham Parkins QC, produced a petrol receipt for December the 6th, the most dramatic twist in the defence case so far. It showed that Steele signed a credit card slip at a garage around 8 miles and 20 minutes drive away from Mark's Tay at 5.01pm on the day of the murders. Mr Parkins added, If you then arrived in Mark's Tay from the direction Nichols said you did, would it take even longer? Steele replied, Yes, it would be slower you would encounter all the traffic. The petrol receipt also showed four-star petrol was purchased, the fuel on which still ran his Renault car. The Toyota Hilux off-road vehicle Nichols claims Steele was driving uses diesel. Nichols has also told the court a call from Wom's mobile phone to his own mobile at 6.59pm that evening was the signal for him to pick up Steele and Wom's from Workhouse Lane. He said they then drove to a pub in Rayleigh before still returned to his home in St Mary's Road, Great Bentley, Essex. But the defence said it will prove he was back in his bungalow by 7.30pm to meet his former sister-in-law and her daughter. The defence played tapes in court of telephone calls to steal by two undercover police officers posing as IRA members Billy and John. They are heard telling Steele they were owed money by the dead men and demand that he comes up with the cash. Senior police officers have testified the detectives were not authorised to make any such threats to steal. Yet on the tapes, the officers are heard saying, You are going to have to immigrate, that's the only way, because I'm going to have to follow this up, and I have A-levels in whacking people. Other sinister lines include, The ceasefire's gone, Mickey, and your ceasefire's gone. They also tell him to watch his car. The trial continues. The next newspaper article comes from the Evening Echo, dated the 14th of November 1997, with the headline, Champagne Alibi in Rettendon Murder Trial. The sister-in-law of a triple murder defendant told how they sipped champagne together less than two hours after the brutal killings. Postwoman Phyllis Stanbrook of Point Clear near Clacton was giving evidence in defence of Michael Steele, 54, who is accused of murdering drug dealers Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe on December 6th, 1995. The prosecution alleges the killings took place between 6.45pm and 7pm on December 6th. However, Mrs Stanbrook testified that Steele was at his home in St Mary's Road, Great Bentley at 7.30pm that night. She told the court she was considering buying his bungalow. Steele had invited them to look around it. She added, when we arrived, they were having a celebration. They had signed a contract that day for a new property, and we had champagne. But Andrew Monday QC, prosecuting, revealed that Steele's defence team did not ask Mrs Stanbrook to give evidence until March this year. 
and in a police statement she made this month, Mrs Stanbrook stated it was Steele's solicitor who told her the night of her visit was December the 6th. He continued, Let's say he spoke to you on March the 1st. If I had asked you on February the 28th on what date you went round to see Mr Steele, what would you have said? Mrs Stanbrook replied, I would have said, I cannot recall. The trial continues. The next newspaper article comes from the Malden and Burnham Standard, dated on the 20th of November 1997, with the headline, Malden Teacher Says I Saw Victims. A Malden school teacher has told how she spotted the victims of a triple shooting tailing a mystery Sierra on the night they died. Rebecca Carter, who was a surprise witness in the defence case of Michael Steele and Jack Wombs, said she noticed a trio at the Rettenden Turnpike roundabout less than a mile from where the bodies were found inside a Range Rover. The hushed Old Bailey courtroom heard that the Canvey School Geography Department head was driving to her Malden home on the day of their deaths, December the 6th, 1995. When she had to stop at traffic lights, she told the court, a Range Rover was in the next lane and I could see three men inside it. I couldn't see the driver perfectly clearly, but there was someone in the front passenger seat. Graham Parkins QC defending Steele asked her, what did you notice about the build of these two men? She replied, they were very large, very muscular, big men. She also revealed there was a passenger in the back leaning forward between the front two seats. Mrs Carter was asked what his build had been like. She told the court, he struck me as massive basically. The dead men were drug dealers Pat Tate, 37, Tony Tucker, 38 and 26 year old Craig Rolfe. All three were bodybuilders and Tate, who was found in the back seat, regularly used steroids. Still, 54 of St Mary's Road, Great Bentley and Wombs, 36 of Main Road, Brockford, Suffolk, have denied murdering them following a disagreement over a cannabis deal. Darren Nichols, a prosecution witness, has claimed that he picked up Steele and Wombs from Workhouse Lane near White's House Farm at 7pm on the night of the killings in a beige Passat. But Mrs Carter, who now lives in Benfleet, told the Old Bailey jury that she spotted the Range Rover at 5.45pm. She was interviewed by police days later and was able to identify photos of Tate and Tucker. She added, there was a white Sierra. I believe it was a sea reg, which the Range Rover was trying to keep up with, and I got the impression they were together. Although she could not see the Sierra's driver, she described the front seat passenger as a big man who filled the seat and was well dressed in a dark jacket with epaulets on the shoulder. As they reached White House Farm, Mrs Carter said the Sierra braked suddenly and indicated it was turning right. The Range Rover did the same. During cross-examination by prosecutor Andrew Monday QC, Mrs Carter was asked how sure she was of the identity of the men in the Range Rover. She responded, The man in the back, I'm definitely sure of. The man in the front, I'm almost sure of. The trial continues. Okay, so just to give you a bit of background regarding this article and this statement. Now, Mrs Carter, or Mrs Carr as she's referred to in the official statements, she re-attended the police station a couple of days after giving her initial statement and she correctly identified and picked out via photos at least one of the occupants of the Range Rover. What's interesting is this vehicle, the White Sierra, actually turns into White House Farm, which is only a few yards from where the Range Rover was discovered on December the 7th, containing Tucker, Tate and Rolf. Okay, so if you just take a look at the following photograph, this should give you a better idea of what she's talking about here. So let's just visit part of her original statement where she said the following. The car park is part of the farm shop. There's a round silo bin there. I looked to my right and could see the Sierra turning in a wide circle back towards the exit and the Range Rover was turning the same way, but in a tighter circle towards the exit. I then moved away in the flow of traffic. Now, interestingly, this is also backed up by Frances Theobald, who is one of the owners of White House Farm itself, where she claims that a dark colored Range Rover and a white vehicle both pulled into the car park they did a loop back onto the main road and back towards the lane itself. The following article comes from the Evening Echo, dated the 26th of November 1997, with the headline, Murder Trial Hears of Alibi. A lover of one of the two men accused of a triple gangland killing claims he has the perfect alibi, sausage rolls. Jacqueline Street claimed in a signed statement she bought and cooked sausage rolls with Michael Steele during the crucial hours Pat Tate, Craig Rolfe and Tony Tucker were gunned down in a quiet country lane. 
but the 52-year-old will never take the Old Bailey stand after doctors confirmed she was suffering from severe depression. Jacqueline Street's statement alleges 54-year-old Steele was with her on the day of the Savage Gangland shootings. Her statement, said to have been made before she became ill, kept lawyers locked in a legal battle for nearly two days. However, when it was finally read to the jury yesterday, the judge pointed out that parts would be strongly disputed by the prosecution. In the statement read out by Defence Counsel Graham Parkins QC, she claimed she and Steele went to Bullfan near Greys to buy a trailer. She recalled first going to Tesco in Colchester to buy sausage rolls and drink, which she believed to be gin and vodka. Miss Street also remembered passing Shenfield travelling on the A12 before reaching the A127 and going on to Bullfan. She said no one was in when they went to pick up the trailer, so still hitched it onto the back of his Renault car and they returned home. Miss Street claimed she cooked the sausage rolls for a couple who were interested in buying their house at 9pm, allegedly two hours after the killings of Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe. Steele and Wombs both deny murder. They also plead not guilty along with Peter Corey to conspiracy to smuggle drugs. The trial continues. Many thanks for joining me for today's video. In a short while, you'll be able to see some other videos in front of you from the channel and also the Essex Boys playlist, which has all of the videos concerning this case in one convenient folder. So feel free to work your way through those. Many thanks again for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you again in the next video. Take care. Cheers.